Hello and good morning from wherever you're joining us in the world today. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome to today's Fringe cast, uh, live from fr the center of the fringe, um, as it happens. Um, so, I think the first thing to do is kind of let you know who's involved today, um, as we bring to you a bit of a unique Fringe cast, in that we're kind of recapping every Fringe cast we've done this season so far, so kind of putting three hours into one. Um, so first off, uh, I'm Alan. I'm the registration manager here at the Fringe Society, which basically means I process of shows registering, uh, signing off and approving for the programme, and also events such as this. Um, Katie. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm the Artist Development Manager here at the Fringe Society, and that means that I um, guide and advise artists in their professional and creative development at the Fringe and beyond. Oh, <laughs> you're so much more succinct than me, <laughs> and always. And Daniel. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at the Fringe Society, so I look after our social media, our email marketing, photography, video, and all the tech behind the scenes today. So if you can't hear us, I mean, if you can't hear this now, it's pretty useless, but if you yeah. can't hear us, 
do let us know and we'll try and get that sorted. It's all Daniel's fault, yeah. if you can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably my fault for also not using my microphone correctly. So there may be there may just be prompts for Alan not using his microphone if this is anything like our last fringe cast. Um but Daniel, can you start us off by telling us how exactly do fringe casts work? How should people engage with us? So fringe casts are a little odd. They are live streamed interactive podcasts so they're kind of like a podcast but not as good because we have no way of editing it we haven't got any theme music or or little little buffer noises or anything like that it uh, makes them more dangerous exciting anything anything can happen, can happen. can uh, we get theme music <laughs> maybe i would love theme music <laughs> uh, and particularly today because like alan says we're squeezing three sessions into one so what we're really looking to do is hear um what you want to know about bringing a show to the fringe. We've got a range of topics we can cover, um, but it's sort of really down to you. Um, and the way we can hear from you is using the live chat on YouTube. And we've already got a few of you guys um, who've typed in the box to say where they're tuning in from. So we've got uh, Yvonne tuning in from Brittany in France, uh, someone tuning in from Sheffield, um, and uh, some familiar friends who I definitely recognize from previous sessions. Great. Fans. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> and to all of you that are new, thank you for joining us. So if you've, so if you've um, not used the live chat yet, if you're on a desktop or a laptop, you can find the live chat in the top right-hand corner of the screen. And to leave a comment, you just need to log into YouTube using any Google account. If you're on a tablet or a phone, it's a little bit more tricky. There's a button that says live chat, but it can be anywhere. Genuinely, it could be above, <laughs> below, or to the left, or to the right of the screen. But if you tap that, you should see the conversations that are happening and you can get in touch. But if for whatever reason you can't get onto the live chat or, or log in, you can also just tweet us using the hashtag FringeCast or just mention us at EdFringe and I will try and find that. A uh, few more things about FringeCast. Uh, these sessions are unscripted. Um, so sorry if we, we go off topic or we miss what's going on, but we will try and cover every question you put in the live chat. These sessions are recorded as we go. So if you missed something or you weren't sure what was going on, you can come back to it later. But we really recommend sticking with us live as we go because you could be typing a question into the chat box, which we're talking about that very moment. And speaking of that chat box, all of that conversation is also saved. So when these guys are talking about all the resources we have online, I will try and keep up and pop the URLs in the box uh, so you can get them later. You don't have to rush and put them in your bookmarks. box. And if there's any question that you miss um, or that we don't get the chance to cover in today's session, um, we will, if you want to follow up with that, you can email participants at edfringe.com, which I think is going to be the first link that uh, Daniel is going to pop into the comments box. You're also going to hear that email a lot. Like if there's one thing you take away from today, participants at edfringe.com is a really good one for it to be. That is a really good like sort of central um, first point of call for almost... Everything. Anything, everything. <laughs> it's only in that moment I, f I, I forget how the word participants is spelt. Ah. The pressure. So that's now in the live chat. Amazing. Thanks, Daniel. We've got Eric tuning in from Luxembourg. I think it's Ooh. the first time we've had someone tune in from there. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Welcome, Luxembourg. Um, so this um, fringe cast specifically, like we said, is a bit unique in that it's kind of a reintroduction. So it's basically whatever stage of the journey you're at, we kind of want to tailor it to you. So we've... Um, through the magic of PowerPoint, have put some um, options there on the board. We can basically talk about any and all, maybe not quite all in an hour, um, but that's the kind of uh, topics that you could cover that you should be thinking about. So any questions relating to any of that, we should um, be able to And even to. if it's, it's not relating to something on the board, we may either know the answer or know where you could find it. Yeah. Exactly. And actually, uh, the final point to start, get us properly started, we've actually got a special message um, from Shona McCarthy, our chief exec, to welcome you to Fringe 2019 and your journey towards it. Hi, I'm Shona McCarthy. I'm the chief executive of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society. I'm really delighted that you guys have all tuned in today. Um, the start of your Fringe journey. Um, you can tell from my voice that I absolutely love this festival um, and I wish you all really well. Um, the Fringe Society are here to help you as participants, to give you advice, uh, to give you support along this journey. So please, please talk to our team, listen into these podcasts um, and ask us anything. Uh, nothing is too uh, nothing is too crazy to ask us about this this process of becoming part of this amazing festival. Nothing is too crazy. Yeah, Shona's great. I really um, love the way she talks about the fringe. She's always really excited about the whole thing. So the fringe. The fringe. Shall we start at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. So very good place to start. One of the things when we ask people what information they're looking for before when you sign up for a fringe cast. 
every time people are asking about um, how they apply um, and questions such as that. So we always want to really establish what our fringe story is because it really helps you understand what makes the fringe unique and how it works as a festival. So, Katie, I'm throwing to you. Great. Tell our story. So the Fringe started in 1947 in the wake of the Edinburgh International um, Festival being founded, uh, in which eight theatre groups that weren't invited to the programmed festival um, turned up anyway. They wanted to perform their own shows and they found their own venues to do so in, and they sold their own tickets, found their own um, audiences, and very much performed on what was then known as the Fringe of the International Festival. Um, between 1947 and 1958, this phenomenon kept on growing and um, just grew and grew every single year and um, th at that point it was decided by a group of artists that they should set up a central body, um, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society, in order to support this growth and create a centralised box office and a centralised resource to help audiences find shows, help supporters or support um, performers put on shows and to promote the festival um, in the UK and abroad and that is very much the ethos of the Fringe Society today, um, it's very much in existence to support the artists that are putting on their shows and everyone that's involved in this in the festival. Yeah, do you know, it's still, it kind of still takes me back, anytime we talk about the history, how similar, I mean, obviously on a very different scale, but how similar the, the main ethos is to those eight companies who just turned up. No one's going to tell you you can or can't. Yeah, um, and it's attend. very much, you know, it remains open access today. Anyone can come as long as they have a story to tell and a venue in which to tell it. Open access, that's a nice little buzzword there, Katie. Just, um, so you'll hear us talk about open access a lot um, and the nature of what that means. Um, and who better to discuss that um, than Shona? You know, I wouldn't have come to work on any other festival in the world. Um, the, the reason that I wanted to come to the Fringe um, to work here is because, uh, is because it's got that open access principle. Um, and for some people, it's kind of hard to work out what does that actually mean? Um, and what it actually means is that, um, that we don't program it, we don't curate it, we don't select the work for it. Um, the Fringe is quite literally a platform where any creative idea or person or company who has an idea that they want to share through the performing arts, if you can find a venue in Edinburgh to host you, then you can perform on the fringe. Um, so there's no barriers, there's no curatorial decision-making process that the Fringe Society puts in place. Um, it, you know, whether you're putting on your very first show or whether you are an absolutely top-of-your-game professional, um, everyone's treated the same here at the Fringe. So there's a kind of beautiful underpinning cultural democracy about this festival that appealed to me. So hopefully that covers the introduction of what open access is. Um, and as we go along through the hour, we'll go into some of the more, more the details of how it works in practice. Um, I've just spotted we've had quite a few people join us late. So thanks so much uh, for joining today. Um, this is an interactive podcast. So we've got hundreds of things we could talk about today, but we really want to center this around you and what you need to, you want to learn and find out about the Fringe. Um, so if you haven't already, make sure to head to the live chat box, which is either in the top right hand corner on a de desktop or laptop or under the live chat button on a mobile device and just ask us anything and I'll ask these guys your questions and they'll either know the answer or where they can find it. Yeah, and let us know where in your journey you are. Have you already found your venue? Have you already registered your show? Are you still looking? Um, you know, what kind of state stage are you at at the moment and what do you need to know next? Yeah, it's the joy of these. We can tailor it specifically to you. Exactly. So Shona is, like she said, she's the chief executive of the Fringe Society. Do you want to go into a bit more detail about the Fringe Society and what it does and how we're here to help? Yeah, so basically the Fringe Society is a charity. Um, we exist, we don't um, manage or govern the Fringe in any way. Think of us more as someone who, a group that supports the Fringe, the running of it. As Katie says, we market it to the world, but we're also um, almost primarily there for participants to support artists through your journey. So the fact you're engaging with us now is a really great start and actually staying engaged with us through each stage of the journey. One thing, like, so I've been there myself before um, I came to work at the Fringe. I've put on my own Fringe shows. And the thing that surprised me when I engaged with the Fringe Society and got their help was realizing I didn't know what I didn't know. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's all the stuff that you're like, yeah, no, I know that. I know I need to find a venue, but like I had no idea what public liability insurance was <laughs> yeah, until way too close to my show. <laughs> even the resources that exist for artists outside of your own venue, you know, knowing what the fringe offers you, knowing what comes with that registration fee, and knowing the support that's in place to make the most of your fringe is so so important to know. Absolutely, and you you mentioned the registration fee, and I think it's a good thing to talk about now rather yeah. than uh, about the registration process. Um, so you'll be there'll be one time that you pay any money to the Fringe Society uh, unless you're choosing to do additional advertising um, yourself. So if you can hear that, there may be some uh, external work happening I think to the someone, uh, it's one of us tunneling out of the room. Yeah, no. <laughs> what was that? Katie's trying to tunnel away from me. <laughs> um, completely lost my train of thought. Yeah. Um, Daniel, what was I saying? <laughs> Um, registration, registration fees. fees. Well, registration it's the fees, only thing you exactly. pay, pay the Fringe Society. Yeah, unless you were d- opting to do some like, additional advertising or, or giving a donation. Or, yeah. yes, Katie's we're a charity, favorite. and Absolutely. if you were to give a donation or become a friend of the Fringe, you would also be um, donating to our charitable cause. I genuinely am a proud friend of the Fringe. Um, I am too. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say, though, is your registration fee, a lot of people, there's this sort of myth that what it is is you're just paying to be in the Fringe programme or yeah. on the website. Whereas actually, yes, that listing is a part of it. But if you're a ticketed show, we're going to sell your tickets. Um, if you're needing any help or advice throughout any of the journey, that's exactly why we're here. And that support, whether it be like lists of contacts or actually just some advice, like us sit down one to one. Um, but then also your favourite building, Katie, which I know we're going to talk about later, it gives you access to Fringe Central and all of the services and events that come with that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as you said, we will talk about that a little bit in the future um, of this podcast, but also bear Fringe Central in mind. Um, know that it is a bill dedicated to artists that are at the Fringe and to support you um, while you're here. And um, there's a lot of uh, really exciting things that happen there. So, Daniel? Do you have uh, a? I had a completely unrelated great. thing, but it was just uh, on the picture we have on screen. So if you've never been to Edinburgh, you've never been to the Fringe before, you may come across images like this, which are really iconic sort of mm-hmm. image of the Fringe. And That's I think actually me on the unicycle. <laughs> 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 well, look, I know that this is, we don't have the webcam on because otherwise you'd be. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a really famous uh, picture from uh, the Virgin Money Street Events, which is a huge street festival mm-hmm. as part of the fringe but this is that's a little bit different to what we're going to be covering today isn't it Alan, yeah throwing it at you <laughs> yeah i uh, you know i love answering questions about this um yeah a lot of people will come in um, to sessions like this and they'll want to know how do they register to be part of the street events um yeah. which you can absolutely do but it is something a little bit separate from if you're in a a venue or an indoor space so if you're looking to do like a circle show or perform um on the street it is a separate festival mm-hmm. kind of within our festival <laughs> yeah and you know this this part uh, this fringe cast is very much looking at um a lot of the information that you'd need to register a staged show within a venue and street events is one of our favorite parts of the fringe yeah. um the timeline for it is slightly different and we won't be really going into depth on it today um it, it's uh, the timeline at the moment is a little bit more focused towards putting on a show within a venue um so daniel has um some information on how you can find out more about being part yeah, of the street I've just events. popped a, a link into our guide to that and like katie was saying the registration process for the street events typically opens in sort of may april may time yeah um so right now we're focusing on finding a venue also if participants at edfringe.com is the holy grail of those doing a uh, show in a venue then mm-hmm. street events it's quite easy to remember at edfringe.com is a really good place to sort of start any sort of general inquiries about any kind of performance on the street or getting involved um, in those events and, and finally my final thing on this picture I really love it as a, as a bit of a metaphor that the Fringe Society is just sat in the background just chilling like you say we don't run the fringe we don't run the venues we don't pick the shows but we're here in the background just underpinning and trying to help people on their journey to it to perform to visit yeah absolutely um and i guess the the last thing we wanted to cover about the sort of fringe itself to really get your heads around what it is is the sort of the idea of the scale itself um so i'm just going to um put up some numbers mm. um and these are the numbers from last year so the 2018 uh, program yeah so obviously from those first 
eight shows in 1947, the fringe has grown just ever added so 3, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's grown to reach a scale like no other, really. Um, it's now the largest open access arts festival in the world. And in terms of ticketed events, it's second only to the Olympics. Um, so the figures you can see on the screen there are from the 2018 fringe and um, 3,548 shows, which is um, a mad amount, it's it's huge, um, within 317 venues. Now, those 317 venues are all individual venues, but some of them within them will have up to 10, maybe more mm -hmm. spaces. So it's not to say that there's just 317 spaces. something like spaces. There's, there's more than a thousand different unique spaces in which yeah. you could perform a show. And that doesn't even include the street events. That's that whole separate performing space. And the reason we mention scale it's not us uh, showing off or trying to be like, hey, look how big we are. It's actually much more of a awareness of what the culture is, of what yeah. you're kind of walking into. A lot of people, if it's your first fringe, um, as a participant, maybe you've never even visited the fringe before and your first journey with us is going to be taking the leap to tell your own story. Um, knowing what that scale is that you're walking into is really helpful because it's a bit of a culture shock it's almost like going to another country or like yeah absolutely and also some being people aware literally is going to another country i do this <laughs> <laughs> um being aware also of um you know how many shows there are on and how that affects what um your audience mm. numbers might be and where you sit within the fringe and the content of your show you know knowing that if you're offering something quite unique it might be more appealing to audience or to media or to arts industry and being very aware from the very start of the the size and the scale and, of the fringe and just look Looking at these numbers, uh, we I'm just going to pop in last year's program because it's a really good ref. I know Katie Great. always loves to talk about this and looking at scale and getting a feel for where your show fits. Yeah. Amongst, amongst all the fringe. Yeah, and it's really important. And it's one of the things that I say in every one of these fringe casts is um, if you are trying to figure out where it is that you fit within the fringe, and this um, we'll cover a little bit in a while um, when it comes to finding venues, um, looking through last year's program or even the program from the year before and um, seeing shows that are similar to your own, seeing um, what kind of spaces they were in, what section of the program they were in, um, what venues they sat within, and then looking at those shows and, you know, how they're doing now after the fringe um you know it's what six six months since the fringe seeing if these um companies have toured and where they've toured to have they got a producer have they got an agent who are they working with um and just knowing which path they're on and and where you should start on that path and very much pitching yourself along along that same route uh, absolutely and this isn't meant to be like a sort of overly cheesy point but to add to what katie was saying is the the good thing about those numbers is you're the Fringe isn't somewhere where you're like competing against other artists. Like the audience is huge and as diverse as the number of shows itself. And actually finding your tribe within that is a really special thing. And actually the people who we see year after year having successful times and making the most of their Fringe experience are the people who are aware that actually it's about opening up your experience and going to see other shows it's, it's almost as if you know what the next i was just about <laughs> to say and a great place to do that is but just before we jump i'm gonna <laughs> quick just to build up the tension um just a tiny sort of housekeeping thank you so much for the questions we had coming in so okay. far um i haven't thrown any of them to the guys because i i know what we're coming on to um so all the questions so far we're going to cover today um, we genuinely so can't see them it's do, exciting they, <laughs> they don't know what i'm about to, to throw at them um oh, so God. We will answer all these questions, so don't worry. We will come to them and do keep them coming. And if you think of something after we've talked about the topic, so we're moving on to venues in a moment. If mm -hmm. after that section you've still got a question about venues, please do put it in the live chat because we'll try and answer every single one of them as we go. Sorry for so a great ruining the place moment. to do that is <laughs> so making the most of your fringe. Um, one of the very central parts to, oh, very central parts to that, I didn't even mean to do that, that was really cheesy, um, is Fringe Central. And um, Fringe Central is, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, it's the participants hub. It's very much um, your home away from home when you're at the Fringe. Um, yes, you definitely have spaces to, to spend time and to chill out within your venues, but Fringe Central is um, very much open to every artist that is um, registered at the Fringe and uh, regardless of your venue or of what kind of show you're in, of um, where you're from or what you're doing on the fringe um, and you know it's it's a place for you to come and, and 
hang out on our sofas and bean bags, but also grab a cup of coffee in between your shows. There's a lot of admin facilities where you can come and print your flyers and um, print any sort of pull quotes from from your reviews and staple. You know, we've loads of staplers. It's really basic, <laughs> so, but it's actually sorry, really, guys, really useful. Sorry, this is a bit of a joke. Katie always loves those staplers. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's very useful to to know that you can come and you can do this stuff at um, at Fringe Central. And in addition to that, it's where a lot of our um, artist and participant facing teams live. Well, live essentially during August. Um, our teams move there, and um, we're there as a very um, front facing. Um, staff team and we're there to answer your questions and support you during your time at the fringe um, we have over we have a huge program of professional development events that also go on at fringe central um, and these go from anything to um, workshops to skill building sessions to one-to-one sessions with experts in the industry um, to panel sessions and what you can see on screen now is one of the panel discussions that we um, hosted at fringe central last year which was called dragging you into the mainstream um, presented by civil disobedience and they um, had a really interesting and inspirational panel on what it's like to be a drag performer at the fringe and um, what it's like to to do that now that drag has become mainstream and it's all of these really interesting and current topics and you know it's it's a really really great place to go and network with people it's where you pick up your participant pass but also where the industry pick up their pass and where the media pick up theirs so really get, great place to intercept those people that you really want to talk to also fun bit of trivia 2019, the first year ever that drag is now an official subgenre oh, in the French program. That's exciting. Let me just drop in tidbits. <laughs> Um, so just before we get started on choosing a venue, um, we wanted to just remind you of um, our Decision Is Yours uh, panel board. So basically anything you've got, we, we've kind of got a framework of how the session can run. But if there's anything in particular you want to lead us down, I know Daniel can see those questions that you've asked Um I like that air of mystery that we don't know what's coming. Um, so yeah, any questions you have on any of those things, please do get in touch. But we have four main sections that we're going to cover in the next 35 minutes or so. So, number one, how the fringe works. We kind of covered that. Tech. Tech, what the fringe is. Two, finding a venue. And a, you won't be surprised to hear the majority of the questions are at this stage, how can I find a venue? Yeah, no. How does that all work? So that this is that time. Then we've got planning a budget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then finally, we'll lightly dust on registering your show. You say lightly, but you are the registration manager, so it is kind of your... Probably not going to be as light as he thinks. <laughs> they mock me. There's a reason we put it at the end, because you could talk about it for days. Yeah, they basically reduced me down to, we've only got time to do. Alan, here's one slide. Yeah, that's fair. It's the most magical part of performing at the Fringe, filling out your registration form. It's great. So um, I guess before venues, should we recap the sort of timeline? Because I say this is us covering three sessions in one. So this is a sort of typical timeline of bringing a show to the fringe. Yeah, I would say so. Um, and, you know, one of the key things you'll see there is um, step four, um, which yeah, might seem worry scary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's the thing. Um, step four, this is a general um, overview of when we see the trends happening across the fringe and when we see that people are doing certain things. November to January, choose your venue. That's not necessarily 100% true. It's certainly not too late. It's February now. It's not too late at this stage to find a venue. Um, a lot of venues, especially the ones that um, are programmed and curated, may have most of their shows in place at this time, but that doesn't mean that there won't still be slots available for full runs, for shorter runs, or for even a few days that, um, you know, they're, they're looking to fill those gaps. They, yeah. I, can, I can say for a fact, like... Uh, working in registration like right up until that deadline on the 10th of April which you may hear me reference uh, quite a couple of times um, there there is definitely room that people are sort of expanding growing and changing and that yeah. covers uh, a lot of the questions we've come in we've had Great. one for example um, who probably would have been very nervous on that slide asking I've heard it's too late to register almost every venue is booked is that true? Absolutely Katie and I both not. looked at each other and did a little head shake <laughs> no no 100% not you know it's definitely worth getting in touch with venues at the moment I would say that um, I would go as soon as possible to get in touch with venues but you know shows register all the way up until halfway through the fringe in August um, it's never too late to be part of the fringe and you know that some shows will drop out or not be able to come and there will always be slots to fill uh, and it's the same answer to sort of Wendy's question who asked is it too late to start from scratch this year with just the basic idea of a show and I think we'll go into that in more detail about 
how you approach venues and what information you need. Um, but like like you guys say, you can register up until August. It is still possible. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as you said, we'll touch on that a little bit um, better further down on the next slide, on another slide, even. So just recapping the sort of the basics of taking part and the dates. Yeah, yeah. I basically am just going to keep hammering home participants at edfringe.com. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the most important email address you'll have for the Fringe. Um, and just um, these are some things that if it's on screen right now that would be useful to jot down, but also remember that these slides will be available um, retrospectively for you to look back at. Yeah, it kind of gives you that timeline of the, the dates that are coming up that you may want to hit. Um, ideally, but also um, registration does reopen after that. It's just that 10th of April on the screen is the last time you can register and be included in the printing programme. But last okay. year we had a, several hundred shows who registered after that point. Yes, we did. So it is it is still possible, but we're not going to let you trap us into a registration chat. We're going to yeah. jump, into <laughs> no, jump think, straight think, into venues, I think. I think we're going to uh, jump to a colleague that isn't in the room, if I'm right, Daniel. We are. Another Before we recording. do that, I thought, just for food to thought, I'm going to put our main guide into venues in the live chat now, just because I've written it and it's here. And I know you tend, to, <laughs> you tend to throw random links at me at this point and I don't have time to put them all in. So, so I'm gonna just to briefly um, tell you what Daniel is doing, he's putting the um, guide to finding a fringe venue and that is a really large but really, really useful and detailed document which details um, how you go about finding a venue, how you go about contacting them um, and it details every venue, I believe, that is part yeah. of the fringe and it's really, really useful. Um, in when addition, I came, I literally printed it out using yeah. my using Trees. My works printer on my lunch break and um, the trees the trees yeah you should um, look at it digitally yes it was it was a long time ago when i did that i'm quite old <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's really useful in addition um and actually quite useful to use side by side um along with that fringe guide to finding a venue is the um, venue search tool on our website so looking through that initial guide right now and seeing what's there and what's available but also the venue search tool is an interactive tool on the website that you can go in and you can look um you can change the criteria for your genre or your capacity and um, all of that kind of stuff. And I think Daniel will have put that yeah, into the comments as well. I knew that one was coming. Brilliant. So, that's in. Um, so those are really, really good. And if you if you are a bit overwhelmed by all of that and you need a little bit more guidance on um, narrowing down that massive list of venues, um, you know who to call. It's participants at edfringe.com. And now, now can I do the link? Yeah. You, you can yeah. Now, you can uh, uh, and now the person who, one of the people who resides in that inbox uh, is uh, our colleague, Matt Lord. Hi there, uh, my name is Matt Lord. I'm the Participant Support Officer for the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society. I work as part of the Venues and Companies team, giving advice and guidance on all the logistics of putting on a Fringe show, if you're a performing company or if you're even a Fringe venue. One of the main things we advise on is uh, the process of finding a venue, and it's one of the biggest questions we get into the inbox, is how's the best way to approach that? If I was to give one piece of advice, it would just be to do your research. The venues are as varied in Edinburgh as the individual shows are. And there's lots of different venue services and venue hire models, lots of different kinds of venue with different performance spaces with different levels of technical provision. So if you're wanting to find a venue that's appropriate for you, it's important that you get a really good perspective of all of that different variety of venue that, that, that you can find in Edinburgh. So Matt was describing the the variety of venues you can find at Edinburgh. Like we say, there's over 350. Um, so what are some of the differences between the venues and how they work? Yeah, I guess we should, the first thing we should talk about, and I'm not just saying this because it's I know it's the next slide, um, mm -hmm. but it's the kind of the different models um, on the fringe. Um, so I guess there are four main models, and then we have a a newer model it's kind of like a little offshoot um katie which one do you want to take first i am going to talk uh i'm uh, we'll do them in order i'll okay. do straight higher um so straight higher is very much what it says on the tin which i know is one of alan's favorite phrases buzzwords um so straight higher is very much you pay up front and hire the venue mm. um this means that you know exactly how much you're paying at the very start you know how much you're paying for the services that you're getting in terms of uh, tech marketing um, and all of those kind of yeah. venues that come with your venue and or services yeah. that come with your venue and, and that could mean um, quite a large cost up yeah. front but it also means um, that once you get to August 
the ticket money that starts to come in, that's, exactly. you know that that's all coming back to you. You keep 100% of your box office. And one of the good things about straight hire, um, which can be quite useful for a uh, newcomer to the fringe, if it's your first time, is that it makes it much easier to budget. We will cover budgets a little bit more in um, one of the next slides, I believe. Um, but it makes it really easy to know exactly how much you're spending upfront in your venue. Whereas, Alan, with the box office split... Yeah, it's a bit more uh, up in the air, I guess, yeah. because it depends on your ticket sales. So a box of a split means that you will have that venue on the sort of proviso that the there will be a box office split, <laughs> so to speak, uh, between yourselves as the company and your venue. Mm -hmm. So could you say it's normally maybe traditionally around 60 40 in favor of the company yeah it tends to be um and what is really nice about a box office split as opposed to a straight hire is that it means that the venue is as invested in getting bums mm, on seats absolutely. into your show as you are so they're they're gir they're gurning they're earning or gaining um some gurning. of that gurning <laughs> uh some of that income uh that you're bringing in from your show so with a straight hire it you might find that uh, a venue might be um, less inclined to to support you in marketing that's not yeah. to say that they're they are but it, it you know they're more inclined and invested because they're gaining something from a box office split totally and uh, we said sort of 60 40 there but that's again it's very as with much most things in the fringe it's very up in the air it's very yeah. much to have that conversation and it changes across every venue. Um, you know, it's it's kind of the question of how long is a piece of string. And, you know, it can be 60-40, it could be 70-30. It, it really depends on the venue. So then if you're doing a box of a split with guarantee, that's very much the same kind of process, but there's more of a... Um, almost like a proviso from the venue of you need to reach a certain um, level. Daniel, you put your thought, hand up. That's very I, I put my hand up, very polite. Um, <laughs> just because we had a question that was perfectly timed for oh. this. Oh. Love moment this which is um i know you're going to cover it but so just someone explaining asking the difference between free fringe and uh, as regular fringe as they, they've described it yeah yeah so that's the next point um and just uh the quick thing about the box office split with the guarantee you were about to say that it um, so basically until you you'll have to reach a certain level that will have been pre-decided between you and the venue mm -hmm. um, and once you reach that amount once you reach that sale point yeah. that's when the split goes into focus, goes into play kind of thing. Right, and then um, with a free model, um, you might need to jump in and help me out on this one because um, I know there's a few different um, models on this. And with free, it's very much you don't pay for the hire of the venue and um, you end up with whatever is paid on the door. It's very much a donation system. It's um, money in a hat, essentially. Yeah, and there's two main models there. There's PBH Free Fringe and then Laughing Horse Free Festival. Mm -hmm. Now, both of these, as much as it will be free, they'll have their own sort of ways you apply through them. They will also have um, sort of different ways of working. It might be, um, yep, you've, you've, you're on board, you're, it's free, but actually, could you help out on the door of another show, help with it, get in the get out of that other show? It's very much like bringing in of you. You kind of help keep that venue running for the, for right. the day in some cases. Yeah, so um, you, uh, I guess that could be quite a good community building tool. Yeah. You end up helping to sell other people's shows. And so, you know, straight hire and free are both quite um, lucrative, I think. Well, attractive anyway to somebody that's coming for the first time. Yeah, and I would say when it comes to someone, I believe the question Daniel was like, what's the differences between them? Yeah. Yeah, so I would say in my experience, so my first Fringe was 2009, and I think the difference since 2009 is there. I think there maybe used to be like a little bit of a stigma around the free Fringe, or it used to be like people thought maybe reviewers didn't go there as much, or like audiences would struggle to find it. But actually, mm -hmm. it, the growth of that, and you you see people like nominate for some of the Fringe's biggest awards coming from the free model, and I think it, it's very much about. And this is something you'll hear us talk about a lot, particularly when we go into the sessions that are about making the most of your Fringe experience. Um, something that comes up a lot is like why are you doing the fringe what do mm -hmm. you want to get out of it yeah um, because answering that question will fundamentally play into every decision you make from choosing a venue to other decisions that you make other during decisions. The fringe. <laughs> one of the most and one of the most common questions we get about free free fringe and or other models um really goes back to everything about open access which is some people uh, ask I've applied to a free fringe venue so am I now in the fringe 
And it's, uh, we are jumping the gun and talking about registration, but you know, registration is something you choose to do. You choose to register with the Fringe Society to be included in the program, to be listed on the Fringe website. Uh, yep. And that's and your the only, the only rule we have is you need to have a contract with a venue. That is literally the only thing that we will um, ask at the start. If, as long as you have a contract with the venue, you can register at the Fringe. An offshoot then of the free fringe is that um, one you were talking about slightly earlier, Dan, or Alan, is the pay what you want model. The bonus one. Yeah, so pay what you want, um, as fringe goes, is a relatively young um, idea, but it's really, really picked up like a, a couple of the venues. It's their primary model yeah. of working now. It, it's kind of a combination of the, the all the models, really. <laughs> um, it's... Basically, your audience would have the chance to buy a ticket in advance to guarantee mm -hmm. um, entry into the show. Um, sorry, I keep going away from the microphone. To <laughs> um, they can either uh, buy a ticket in advance to guarantee entry to your show, or they can risk turning up um, without a ticket, at which point they can uh, enter for free as long as there's seats, um, and then make a donation afterwards what they thought the show was worth, hence the pay what you want tag. Um, and so it becomes sort of part of the free model. Amazing. Um, just a couple of uh, questions on that one, um, just so we clear it up now while we were talking about models. Um, the first part was where can we find a free venue? And the second part is if we do a show for free, are we free from copyright and music licensing? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. We, you, you, you wish. If, yeah. it's not, wish, wish. if it's not original work and you're performing it to the public, you have to have copyright and licensing. There's loads of information on our website about that. And if, if you're specifically looking at music licensing, um, one of our uh, team members, Matt, who you heard talking a while ago, yeah, um, is an expert in all things music licensing. Um, and I believe music. Daniel... Yeah, I was going to say music at edfringe.com. Yeah, so yeah, music at edfringe.com. Or um, Daniel, I think, is going to pop some more information on copyright yeah. and licensing in there. In terms of finding a free venue, you covered the, the two yeah, so it's main those, ones. Those models I talked about earlier, and basically just head to head to their we've website got, and you apply through them. And we've got the search toolkit. Yeah, Amazing. Which they're, they're on the... Yeah. Yeah. So just to recap, that's PBH's Free Fringe and then Laughing Horse Free Festival. Mm-hmm. And just uh, that covers the questions on that part of venues. Sorry if I have That's missed right. them. Uh, I wasn't apologizing to you guys. Oh. Just, yeah. if, if you've popped a question and we've missed it, we'll come come back to it but I think that's all the major ones um we've got about 20 minutes to go um one question we did have was about contacting venues so what's our sort of what's our, our next 60 size? second guide to contacting a venue and what we advise about how many to contact and the, the best way there to was do it. a question earlier that you said about um bringing a show to the fringe that is at a very basic stage of development mm -hmm. I believe um so when you're contacting a, a venue all of the stuff that you see on the screen now are kind of the most important things to have available um I would say that there's it's not um bringing a show that isn't fully developed or, or talking about a show and trying to get a venue um for a show that isn't fully developed isn't impossible yeah. and and you're um, not alone you're not There's alone no absolutely um i would say that have as much information about the content of the show about the um production elements of the show as possible um and also it's going back to answering that question of why are you bringing a show um and i think it's one of the most important it is actually the most important question you ask along the way um if your show is in development at the moment be very very clear on why you're bringing it um are you bringing it because you want to try it out in front of new audiences and see where the show fits within the scheme of theatre or whatever genre it's in um, and that's a totally valid reason to bring a show or is it that you're wanting to gain more reputation in the media is it that you want to tour the show after and you want to contact industry be very clear about why you're bringing a show exactly and to just to piggyback on what Katie was saying there is that being able to answer why you're coming and it's really sort of corporate and businessy but that the idea of like an elevator pitch knowing the the story of why you're coming, the story you want to tell and why it's unique and why why you're doing it is so important. As, as someone who brought a show and literally hated when someone would be like, so tell me about your show. And I'm like, oh, great. A show I've been working on for over a year and I have to tell you in 30 seconds mm. everything about it. But actually doing the exercise of coming up with that, that pitch, that what is the show will help you not only when you're trying to pitch to a venue, but every step down the line. So yeah. super quickly, just because of, of time on this slide, uh, just the one question we often get, and I don't know if this the answer to this changes because mm -hmm. of the time of the year, how many venues should people be getting in touch with? 
We always say seven to ten, um, and I don't think that that would change depending on the time of year. I think you should always be contacting seven to ten venues, and that will give you a really good selection of um, people who might be the right fit for you, and also um, being aware that you know if you're contacting that many venues, you'll know immediately who has already programmed or who still has slots available. Yeah, also, like final thing on contacting a venue, I think, is absolute honesty and transparency is mm. a really good way to go. The venues, um, many of them are friends with each other. They talk. They are very much a it's community. It's a small community. Yeah, yeah. so don't don't try and play them off against one another. If you're waiting on a response from one, I realise it can be like you're you're waiting to hear if you're accepted at one, but then the deadline for another is approaching. We often get asked, like, how do you deal with that situation? It sounds a bit of a basic answer, but actually being honest and being like, okay, I'm actually talking to another venue. This, And it's not the case of, like, you're trying to be a harsh negotiator. It's actually just being upfront and being like, oh, I, I am actually talking to other venues. I've, I've got a deadline coming up. Is there a chance I will know from you by this date? Kind of yeah, thing. and then they can get, give you a very simple yes-no answer. So moving on, when you talk to them, um, I'm just going to ask you to pick one of the following. What's the one thing you should ask? What's the one thing you should bear in mind when talking to them. I know, Alan, you, there's a point you often say about this, about never assuming. Yeah, just to, I would say never assume that anything will come with your venue. Just because you've maybe done a show before in your hometown um, and you've, you're like, oh, well, I assume I'll get two hours of tech time or I assume that there'll be a grand piano in the venue. That's a, re that's a, really, it's a like, genuine le example. Legitimately, like, genuinely ask what you want. I had a, my first Fringe experience, I had a lovely experience with my venue and genuinely it was because when they emailed me, I would reply. <laughs> like I would, we'd, we'd kind of have those conversations that might feel difficult at the time or it might feel like you're, you're badgering them at first, but a venue would much rather be talking to you at this time of the year than have you and your company turn up all excited on the first day of uh, the Fringe in August and be like, um, hi, there's not a piano in our space. Mm. And to jump on that bandwagon of um, never assuming, um, knowing the landscape of the Fringe and never assuming that you're going to get the same scale of audience that you would in your hometown or where you usually perform. So if you usually perform in a hundred seater and sell out a five night run, um, that will be very, very different in, in the Fringe landscape. And remembering those um, facts and figures that we showed earlier of there being over 3,500 shows across 317 venues, knowing that there is huge competition for audiences and that you might not sell out a um, 100 seater you might not even sell out a 30 seater and just being very very realistic in um and in your expectations and um pitching your marketing at a very very um useful level we're gonna i'm gonna have to jump Yo, in and we're it. gonna cut uh venue chat there but we can come yeah. back to other questions the next section is budgeting which is quite a quick one before we go on to that we've had a number of different questions coming in from international performers about performing at the fringe um, a lot of that initial information about visas and permits is best covered online. We have written guides to cover all the legal terminology because it, it can explain it a lot better um, than we can now. One of the questions was about, uh, for international performers, how many performances are recommended. I think we'll come on to that when we talk about registration and the number of shows. But let's do budgeting uh, super quickly. So the main thing about budget... Have one. Have one. <laughs> Um, generally, it's it's never too early to start, and and we can help. So there's a budgeting tool which I'm just going to throw to Daniel to see if he can add to the comment section. And alongside that budgeting tool, again, like the. Um, Fringe Guide to Finding a Venue and the Venue Search Tool. If you're using that budget tool, there are a variety of case studies on the website as well, the budgeting um, case studies, which Daniel is also going to put in. Um, and it's very much looking at um, fringe shows that have been here and people that we've speaking, mm. spoken to that have brought shows to the fringe and looking at their facts and figures and of their budgets. And it goes back to that thing I was saying of you don't know what you don't know. So actually looking at those case study budgets, you're suddenly like, oh... I forgot all about and when it. And when it comes to budgeting, there's a number of different topics you may or may not have thought of, and we'll just pop them on the screen now um, if you have any questions about that. Shall we quickly listen to Kevin? Kevin, Kevin yes, Kevin loves, Kevin loves, loves, yeah, Kevin the, loves budget. the budget. So we've uh, he's recorded a sort of a love song to budgets. 
Hello, my name's Kevin. I'm the Venues and Companies Manager here at the Fringe Society, and I head up the Venues and Companies team. And um, our primary role is to support anyone who wants to bring a show to the Fringe or anyone who wants to run a Fringe venue. And within that, obviously, we, we help a lot of people with various aspects of bringing a show to the Fringe. But what I'm going to talk about today, and the team will go into further detail on, um, is budgeting. And really, I have one, um, one major top tip, or I guess one 1.5, one and a half top tip um, that I might give would be to make sure that you prepare a budget, at least. Um, many people are afraid of it. Um, many artistic people perhaps are more um, focused on the content of their show, and, and rightly so. But you also need to make sure that you are um, ahead of the game when it comes to budgeting, and you set yourself up so that you know what you're going to spend, or at least you can have a rough idea of what you're expecting to spend. Um, just to add a, a little bit onto that, I would always make sure that once you do have an idea of what you're going to spend, you add a 10% contingency to that total. So if you've made a budget of, um, of £2,000, you just want to chuck another 10% on there just to make sure that you're covered in, in the event that anything goes awry. Um, it's just a nice wee cushion to have and, and peace of mind as well to take with you when you come to the Fringe. Thank so you, unsur Kevin. unsurprisingly, about budgeting, have a budget. Yeah, mm. it's a great start. And point. the contingency, I think, is a very important point that Kevin raised. Yeah, absolutely. Any of those points that you um, th like haven't thought about, email participants at edfringe.com and they'll be able to sort of point you in the direction of what those costs may be. The, the only yeah. thing we're going to flag off this board um, is kind of the fundraising, sponsorship, and crowdfunding. It's a shameless plug. A though. shameless plug because we have, um, for the very first time, next month on the 12th of March at 6 o'clock UK time, we have a dedicated... 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Not a.m., yeah, right? AM. Of course. Oh, no. <laughs> because we're talking to Adelaide at 6 a.m. another time. Yes. Um, so we're actually joined... Um, by guests from New York, uh, from Kickstarter, and we're going to be covering all the different ways you could fundraise or crowdfund um, for your friend show. Yeah, it's going to be a generally really exciting like opportunity to talk like actual crowdsourcing with the, the experts yeah. um, in it. I think it's going to be really fun. So, Alan, the the bit you've been waiting for, the bit that we've deliberately Can't only given you Alan's about baby. five minutes, you literally to cover. left me ten minutes to talk about my joy um so uh registering with the fringe we've talked a lot about it and um, i guess to start off there are three sort of fundamental ways that a show would register with us uh, one is um and i was gonna say the most common but maybe that's not correct um is that you just register yourself which means you just head to our website it all happens online and um, if you head to the register part um of our take part in the fringe guide uh, it will have a link out to ed fringeware which is our registration software um and whatever happens, whatever method of registration you use, your show will end up in Ed Fringeware, so it's good to know. Um, the other option is, so basically always check with your venue mm. how they will register. Never assume. <laughs> never assume. Um, I thought you were going to start singing Never Enough from Great Showman there, and I don't know where my head's at. Um, <laughs> yeah, so speak to your venue and check, like, will they be registering the show on your behalf or mm -hmm. whether you need to do it yourself? Because some venues will, um, I know, like, sweet venues, for example, they will register all of their shows on their behalf mm -hmm. on Ed Fringeware. Mm -hmm. So they will do that work for you. Um, and then there's a sort of third method, which would be a venue that would have its own method of registration. So you would, um, there's other sites, that one of out there is called Eventatron, where you'd put your information onto that website and it still would eventually end up um, with us but it kind of comes through your venue that way so that's the really important thing is check with your venue how they plan on registration working so what's next the registration process dates and times and what you have to pay yeah this is the the slide of just all of the information that runs through my head on last time basis. we did this we made you read this all out from memory which was a bit cool yeah and you, you were generally surprised i knew it <laughs> like Literally my life. Um, <laughs> so those key dates. Um, I guess we've not actually explained what the discount deadline is. So uh, it's a nice bit of way of saving some money. But Daniel, I guess I should explain what a full run is and a limited run is first. Do we have questions about that? Um, yeah. So some people were asking how many... Well, there was two things. It was how long their run should be um, and whether that's different if you're coming from overseas or not. Uh, then the differences between full and limited run. Uh, yeah. It's good to cover. Yeah. So... Uh, 
you, the, your registration fee is very much determined by the number of performances you're doing. So if you're doing one or two performances, that's a that's a the li most limited run we have, and that's ninety six pounds to register. If you're then going up to doing three to five performances, um, that's still a limited run, and that'd be two hundred and four pounds. And then it comes up to anything that is six performances or more is what we classify as a full run. So if you're doing six more performances of your show, that's a full run, um, and the registration fee for that is three hundred and ninety three pounds sixty. Unless um, <laughs> you have found your venue, you're all sorted, you're ready to go, and you can register your show with us by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, and what, 13th of what, March. What does it mean by register? By that point, what do you have yeah. to have complete? So you need to have all of your information put into Ed French Bear and registered and paid your registration fee by 5 p.m. That doesn't mean you can't make tweaks. So the... We, there'll be required fields where it's like we need to know when your show is, what venue it's in. We need some copy and things, but the, that copy can be tweaked. An image can be added later. Your social media can be added later. It's we basically need the fundamental information. And just going one. back a step, uh, what is Ed Fringeware? Ed Fringeware is the database that I talked about, where you uh, have to put all of the information for your show. And you'll find that on the uh, take part section under yeah. register, won't yeah. you, Daniel? Are you going to pop that, that into or, you know, the you, comments for us? Or you can just us. go straight to registration.edfringe.com. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, what then, once you have registered your show, what's what's next? What's next? <laughs> um, so basically you then enter uh, an approval uh, or a proofing process, um, which some people can get... Um, confused by because they think mm -hmm. once they're registered they're done um, but basically that then comes to uh, the programming and registration team which is very dear to my heart um, and we proof uh, all of the shows that come in uh, we won't fundamentally change your show, but we will bring them in to make sure that it's keeping with the style guide, which we have very much to kind of keep some consistency in the program to help audiences, which is another kind of remit of us to help them like understand um, shows and the festival as well as they can. Um, and just sort of check that everything's with, sort of within our policies and everyone's playing on the same field, so to speak. Um, and then once you're happy with that, you approve your show. And that's when you have two options. You can either approve to go on sale at program launch, um, which you hear lots of talk about as we get through the year. It's our big sort of hooray to the world where the Fringe program is launched and it arrives um, on doorsteps. It's a very exciting day for us. That happens on the 5th of June. But actually, there are on sales every month leading up to that. So if you want to sort of have your tickets on sale longer, start your marketing earlier, and um, just sort of have a more gradual kind of journey to the fringe, you can go on sale earlier. I actually just want to step back very, very quickly um, to talk about the length of runs again, because I know that was a very factual based um statement you got about yeah. um, one to two performances, two to three, and the mm -hmm. prices involved, and six or more being a full run. Um, but there was a specific question about um, whether you should do a longer or shorter run, especially if you're coming um, from a, a country from outside Absolutely. the UK. Um, there is no answer. It, do you know what? It goes back to Katie's... It goes back to that question. It's that it's question. why are you doing the fringe? Why are you doing the fringe? And also, being very clear in your budget, can you, if you're coming from abroad, mm. can you afford that extra accommodation? Um, and, you know, you remembering that your travel also um, costs a lot of money and remembering that, um, you know, it's 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 all down to your budget and it's all down to the question of why are you here? Um, if you're here specifically for uh, getting your show reviewed and getting um, media involved... Um, uh, you know, they tend to be more active towards the first two weeks of the fringe. Whereas if you're looking for international or industry opportunities, um, industry members um, that come here to use the fringe as a marketplace tend to be here towards um, more. They're, they're here all month uh, and so are the yeah. media. But um, there is a concentration of them towards the middle and end of the fringe. So actually, um, I, I always recommend that doing a full run is really, really useful because it gives you that whole month to get your get your show up and running and on your feet and then covering the whole month to really get into the swing of things. Yeah, I'd say the one the one ad real advantage if you're doing a full run, particularly if, you, if you're already making the sort of financial leap and you're making that commitment to, to come and be a part of the Fringe, the thing you gain from a full run um, is that momentum. Yeah. It allows people to find your show, which doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it's testing it in front of different audiences yeah. because different people will be here at different times oh of the week. God. It's really exciting how the change Genuinely, happens. Like, as, uh, like, sorry, I keep going, like, as an artist, as someone who's done it. <laughs> Have you done the Fringe? Oh my God, I've done the Never Fringe. Never mentioned it. <laughs> no. Um, no, but as, 
there has never been a greater learning experience than sitting at the back of an audience for 26 straight performances or whatever and seeing a completely unique audience mm. like differ massively from like a Tuesday daytime <laughs> to like a Saturday afternoon um, ranging wildly and seeing how different people reacted to and, it. And forgive me if you already cover it, but from a sort of a programming point of view, if you're going to a venue with a limited run versus a full run, there's, there's pros and cons as well, aren't there? Yeah, because a lot of the time venues will program their those longer runs first, purely yeah. for logistics of those yeah. that want to fit in. And then they tend to fit in shorter runs around mm. the gaps that are created with, within those full runs. And I don't want it to seem at all that we're being disparaging or putting off. Like if, you, if you've worked out and actually you're like, actually we can do a week. It's absolutely possible. And I've, there's been many success stories of people who've done a shorter run. Definitely. It just, the thing I would say is if you are doing that, be prepared and... It's great that you're engaging with us now because actually I think you just have to be a bit quicker off the mark in terms of your marketing, in terms of letting people know. If you're contacting the press, you're not just being like, oh, I've got a fringe show. It's like, I've got a fringe show. It's a limited time only for just the second week. Yeah. So and go on, Daniel. Oh, well, I was gonna say, there's three minutes to go. Oh, but go ahead. That's the three minutes. Countdown. Minute no, I was, I was just going to um, uh, continue with Alan's point, but it, I think he's made it. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the next big deadlines? Like, so the kind of the ones we walked through were already, were already through the 7th of January, which is when registration opened. 13th of March, that's the discount deadline we talked about. If you can get your show registered by that, you save almost exactly £100. It's just under. And 10th of April is then the cutoff for being included in this year's printed fringe programme. And then obviously Friday the 2nd of August, here before we know it. Fringe! <laughs> launch! And then that run, that takes us right through to Monday the 26th of August. Great. And there are some more... Important. In the meantime, there's some more important dates for the next. Oh, obviously, talk to us. Always yeah. forget this one. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, <laughs> Daniel forgets it's your the job. slides, but it's literally <laughs> social media. Oh. Well, I didn't want to be selfish. <laughs> um, as a starting point, do follow us on social media just so you can keep up to date with all that's going on. We, well, I'm, I'm spoiling the next slide. Let's just jump to the next slide. But think, also, uh, you know, if you follow us on social media, you'll be able to um, get information about more of these fringe casts that are coming up, um, which is the next slide. But um, just getting all of the information that we have available to put out, it um, all goes very much out on social media as well. Yeah, we just kind of wanted to, to give you an idea of the range of topics we're going to be discussing um, and all the different forms um, they're, we're going to be discussing them in. So, like, coming up, we, we talked about the um, event we've got with Kickstarter, talking specifically about crowdfunding and fundraising for your show. Um, but then we also do, we want to, we'll be introducing you soon to how to make the most of your time at the Fringe. So this... That is to, my favourite one. Yeah. It's and it's very much about um, marketing your show and making um, the most of getting audience in and getting media in, but also um, not forgetting that really professional development side of it, of, um, you know, learning what industry are going to be in town and how you can engage with them, learning how to use Fringe Central, how to network with people, um, with peers and with industry as well, and making the most of your time here in terms of your development and your well-being. Yeah, if our sessions so far have been very much about the practicalities of how you bring a show to the fringe we love making the most of because it starts to be a bit more individual a bit more yeah, about it's a bit more intrinsic yeah. and it's, it's a bit more valuable in in your own experience here yeah and how to go like okay you've got the fundamentals there but then how do you make you're that, already the coming and now you can plan your really exciting time here so we've had a couple of questions come in that we don't have slides for, so we'll get to them at the very end oh, no. in a little bonus section we tend to call Fringe Cast Extra. Um, but <laughs> as we wrap up, the first thing we'd love to uh, know is how you found today. Um, we've got a quick feedback survey, um, and it takes just about a minute to complete because we these sessions are for you. We're, they're here to help you, and we'd love to know any way we could improve them or any topics or information you'd like to find out more on. And indeed, when you complete that form, if there was something you missed or you, you didn't have the opportunity to ask, you can put your question and you put your email address in and we'll get back to you about that topic. Yeah, fringe casts are a fairly new venture for us. So actually having you guys out there, the, the participants who make the fringe what it is, like having you decide what they should be about is kind of fundamentally what we're about. So we, we've tried to cover as many different aspects of the fringe um, as possible. So you'll see there in that list things like um, parenting and performing arts. We want to have a bit of a discussion about what are the challenges and 
kind of joys of being a parent and um, doing a fringe show. We want to talk about making your show accessible to as many audiences as possible, um, or their accessibility one. And actually, one that's not on that list, but I know you're really passionate about, Katie, is a month before the fringe, so the 2nd of July, we want to talk about mental health. Yeah, which is, I think, one of the most important things to talk about in advance of the fringe. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, provision for mental health and well-being when you come to the fringe, but actually being prepared before you come up here, laying your expectations and um, putting together essentially a care plan for your time here, making sure that you know when to take breaks, when to take care of yourself, that you're, you're eating healthily and you're um, very much taking a break from the fray because it is a long month. You're, yeah. you're working very hard and you're seeing a lot of shows and you're networking. You're constantly having to be switched on, um, but very much taking care of yourself yeah. in advance of and at your time here. You constantly hear how sort of intense the fringe is in every way, both good and bad, and how much fun it is and how full on it is and how you're, you're go, 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 go. But actually, when people ask us for advice, almost any time we're on any kind of panel, there'll always be one of us that says, take, take a day off, take a, st- take a step back, slow yeah. down, look after yourself. Like genuinely, I've, I've had someone come in for some media advice like in Friend Central um, and like kind of at a really stressful point and rightly so. And actually, the, my first advice was like, All right, if you're happy with sales tomorrow, just take a day off, just have yeah. a day, go up Arthur's seat, head to Glasgow, go to North Berwick on the train, escape that bubble for a little bit. Yes, time. yes, which it is. It's very much a bubble. A wonderful, really, really exciting, <laughs> exhilarating bubble. bubble. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, you know, it is a long and stressful month and knowing that before you get here is really essential. So we've covered our main points in just over an hour. Um, I've been going through the live chat and spotted three questions that we okay. can pick up now. Great. But this is still, you've us. still got a few moments. If there's anything else you want to ask us, anything to do with coming to the Fringe, pop it in the live chat and we'll try and cover it. Um, but the... Um, so this is officially Fringecast Extra. Fringecast Extra. Um, so the I first like question... I feel and Phil. <laughs> so the first question <laughs> is, if um, we do a street event, is that free except for registration fee? There isn't a registration fee um, for... Uh, sorry, I keep looking at Daniel. I will learn how to use this new mic, I promise. Um, there isn't a registration fee when it comes... Um, if you want to perform as part of the street events, um, there is a registration process, but um, it doesn't uh, have the same fee attached to it. But we we put a, put a guide in the chat earlier. It's really worth reading what kind of shows the street events are aimed at. Um, mm-hmm. The main focus is around professional street performers that tend to perform to hundreds of people um, for about a 45-minute show. So it's quite a specific genre. Yeah. There's also yeah. buskers and, and living statues. It's quite and a specific field. It's very specific, but also there is an opportunity yeah. for, for main stage shows to perform on street events to promote their shows. So you can do a small excerpt of your show um, on the street at various times throughout the day in order to, to showcase what your show is about mm. and to fly around that. Yeah, we absolutely have stages on the... Um, street events uh, for people to be uh, involved in and remember it's a really great way to sort of market your show to like uh, the most sort of fringe audience there is like those people like out there experiencing the street events it's a really good way to engage with them and like sort of hook them into the story you've come to Edinburgh Mm -hmm. to tell I think the tunnelling has started again. Uh, yeah, that's the, definitely uh, construction work happening <laughs> outside and not like a phone vibrating on yeah. a table over here. So our next question is, is kind of a registration one, Alan. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, he, oh, he gets more time to talk about his baby. <laughs> so Yvonne has asked, uh, we're a bunch of stand-ups and would love to perform one after the other at the same venue as a sort of troupe. Could we just invent a name for all of us or do we need to be a proper company? I think as part of that, just explaining what we mean by company as well is probably really helpful. Yeah, so things like one of the first things you'll have to do when you're registering a show is you register an organisation that is putting on that show. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be like a fully registered business or like a... Uh, an official organization with like uh, special numbers or or anything like that it's very much like you in the true nature of the fringe it's what you want it to be um an important thing with the bill like that so we we have a, a rule when it comes to registering about like there's one show per listing so you can all share one listing and be really specific about like who's on when but absolutely if you want to do a show that is just a mixed bill of all of you as long as that show is advertised as something as that it's a mixed bill that doesn't go into the specifics then you can absolutely I mean, we, do we that. could register fringe cast and have three of us we'll do whatever we th- i'll talk about social media for half an hour and you can talk about registration yeah i'll just sit here <laughs> <laughs> So we've got uh, two more questions and I think we'll then have to wrap up. 
I've just lost where one of them is. That was it. It was just following up from uh, registering one, say, one, uh, one registration per show. So they're asking, what if the, the content is the same, but they wanted to showcase it in different venues and different dates? They wanted to know, if, does that need separate registrations or can that be done as one registration? Good no, so question. Uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Someone knows Someone's their stuff. thinking ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, so as long as the show is fundamentally the same, if you're performing it in different venues, you do not need to register more than once. You just basically, when you do the form, you, there's a section that we call date lines, which is where you tell us the where your show is on, what time it's on, and basically you just fill out a different date line for each different venue or space. If you need more help with um, your registration and information on that, mm -hmm. and you have very specific questions about registering yeah. your show and this kind of date line stuff, who is the best team to contact? So it's the program reg registration team, and you can get us on program at edfringe.com. Uh, and that's absolutely program with an... Uh, double M E. Double M E in the British way. Yeah, no, I pop that in Excellent. the live chat. So um, just uh, yeah, and just say, like, if you have sort of really technical questions, like, just pop them through in an email, but also we're happy to pick up the phone and sort of chat them through because sometimes that can be the easiest way to deal with a registration inquiry. Yeah, great. And the final question I'm actually just going to take myself. So oh. it's very selfish. Oh, thanks, John, Daniel. John asked right at the top, um, sort of how many people come to the French um, as visitors? And it's, it's a really good question. It, we often said the population of Edinburgh during August doubles or indeed triples. Um, and last year we issued nearly 2.8 million tickets. And that's not even mentioning all the people that attended free shows for which there are no tickets. Wow. So I think that touches upon the answer. But lots of people yeah, yeah. from all walks lots of life of all backgrounds and it's it's impossible to track because some of those people could be buying 70 tickets a lot of people come here for the whole month and, and see shows every single day so it's impossible to to track the amount it's just, it's just people from all over the world with yeah, different interests and different really passions great. and it goes back to that question which is a good one to end on is why are you doing the fringe and what is your show about and fight working out who is your audience and who's going to come and see you yeah, and kind of the answer is never everyone. No. You're never doing a show for everyone. Um, there are people out there who don't like Beyonce. <sighs> I know, I said it. Uh, um, you want to know what you, the, the great thing about the fringe audience is it's as diverse as the fringe itself. So know what you're doing. And if it's niche, then it's niche. Great, go after that niche audience. Sell it that way. If it's something that's really unusual and really un unique and slightly off the beaten track, then you know, that you're going to find your audience for that and they're going to be really specific and really excited about the work that you're putting on. So I think that's it for today. Um, we've still got on, on screen the upcoming Fringe cast. We'd really love you to tune in for one of our future episodes. Don't forget you can listen back um, to today's session at any point. Look at the live chat if you've missed anything. Um, before we sign off, any last tips or advice to close on or any, any of the points? I think we kind of covered the, the whole taking a break thing and taking care mm. of yourself. Um, I am going to maybe steal one of Daniel's ones here oh, in no. that I'm talking about um, your your journey on social media and I know Daniel will go a little bit more in depth on this but I think actually um, sharing with other people that are coming to the fringe about these fringe casts so they can get this information before they come um, making sure that you're if you you know it's it's likely that you'll know people coming to the fringe and, and they might not know that these are going on and they might not know that this information is available and you know you can send them the link and, and share it with them and let them watch it back and encourage them to join us for the next live one. Yeah, and I'd say mine sort of goes on from that. It's don't be a stranger. You've engaged with us now. Like, stay engaged. Um, like, genuinely, we can... Every step of the process, it's almost... You, you find people um, in August that are having a great time and they engage with that participant's email address back in, like, January. And then they've almost been, like, the baton has passed from, like, around all the departments. So as by the time they arrive in August, they've had help with their press release. They've talked to Katie about touring. They've... Um, like uh, engaged about their their venue or mm. they know what's part of the French Central program and actually it's, it's that thing of I mean I've said it way too many times this um, French cast but you don't know what you don't know so actually sort of staying engaged and even if you think you're kind of oh I think I'm pretty good with that actually just like meeting other peers and talking about it you kind of you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, and even if you do think you're on top of everything, always check in so that you can get that validation. And yeah. so that you may be getting really stressed about something that we can literally answer in two minutes and be like, "Oh no, you're fine." Yeah, I have two. They're very quick. Is it the, social media, Daniel? No, one of them, obviously. Um, but just to balance that out, uh, we have squeezed three hours of content into one hour and eleven minutes. Uh, so we ran over slightly. So thank you for sticking with us. 
for all these topics we've been covering, we have three separate FringeCast recordings, which you can find on the information sessions page on our website, which we've popped in the live chat, where we go into more detail about budgeting and finding a venue and registering. So there's the, the fringe cast point. Final social media point is that this year's uh, fringe hashtag is hashtag make your fringe. And this is really helpful when we went back to our earlier point that there's kind of no such thing as an original idea and the importance of taking inspiration from your peers. So it's really worth looking at that hashtag, uh, particularly on Twitter and Instagram and seeing what other performers are doing at this point. Cause some, you know, there's already a hundred shows online. There's more to come at the end of this month. So get a feel for how they're promoting their show. Cause that's always the best starting point, particularly if you've never brought a show to the fringe before so that was hashtag make, make your, your fringe, fringe. Yes. amazing and we'll be revealing more about that in the coming weeks and months and we'll Ooh. obviously give you guys Lala. the inside track um just so you can get ahead of the game and start talking about your fringe journey and sharing it with the world fun great well i guess all that's left to say is thank you so much for joining us this morning or whatever time it is at whatever part in the world you're coming to us from um We've really enjoyed talking to you today, and yeah, don't Thank be strangers. Thank you for the questions as Thank well. Thank you very much. Really good Great stuff. Really good. Yeah, and hope you can tune into a fringe cast in the future, and we'll talk to you then. See you soon. See Hopefully, you. with a theme tune. Hopefully.